I think interest on reserves is brilliant. I, I hope whoever dreamed that up uh, has a permanent parking space and, and a raise, and they're getting the, the credit because uh, I like how forward thinking it is, and I think it's really creative. Um, I'd like to ask you something about quantitative easing um, because um, it, I've heard some people are starting to draw some parallels between what's happened in Greece and Italy to here, but they're, they're noting some differences. Um, in Greece, it was what George Papandreos and Lucas Papademos. I, sorry, the last names are so much the same, I get them confused. You have an elected president out, and then you have somebody with a banking history in. Same thing happened in Italy uh, with Mario Monti. And in the wake of that, um, and these folks both had Goldman Sachs ties, so now you get some conspiracy theories kind of going around with this. And, and, and the news after that, they start talking about how those countries were turning over their assets and selling their assets to try and pay off their debt. Um, you heard about people, uh, uh, places in Greece that were selling bus stations or museums or public transit, you know. And a little bit of that's maybe happened in California. But what I've heard is that and maybe you can comment to this, is that there's kind of a parallel going on here, that the Federal Reserve is expanding its balance sheet, quadrupling it, um, and in return, uh, to try and make that accounting work out, you have, to, you have to kind of print some money and give it to the banks, and then that's tied to the, to the Treasury um, securities that are you know, basically a result of our also increasing debt. So there's a correlation here. And the concern, that I've heard is, is that basically what our country is doing is we're turning our assets over to the banking system and getting nothing in return but inflation or debt or both. And I wonder if you can comment on that. Yeah, so you've asked a, um, a complex question, a good question. I would summarize it as saying, um, is the United States in danger of becoming like Greece and Italy? So um, let me give uh, this uh, question, as it's, because it's an interesting one, I'm going to spend a little bit of time on it, but it's a multi-part um, answer. So the first uh, part is um, we've got to remember here that the Fed is the central bank of the United States. So we have this mandate on inflation and maximum employment, but we're not... Um, um, you know, we're not the ones who issues uh, debt. That's the Treasury Department. So that's, um, that's a separate entity. The Treasury Department, they manage the fiscal finances of the uh, U.S. government. And um, they're, you know, it's the Treasury Department that, for example, is running these uh, federal budget deficits uh, that have been um, uh, essentially expanding uh, fairly rapidly since uh, 2000, and then especially um, as a result of this uh, recession. So the federal government has run um, some budget deficits, meaning their tax revenue has been far less than their spending. And, uh, but that is kind of a separate thing from the Federal Reserve, where we're just this uh, central bank and uh, we're trying to you know, manage the inflation rate and, and, uh, and, and maximize uh, employment. So that's one thing I want to make sure that we all understand that there's two separate entities here. Um, uh, we've got our mission and uh, we, we kind of do our thing um, buying these treasury securities to, to try to manage the inflation rate and also economic activity. And then there's the federal government whose finances are controlled by the treasury department and they're the ones who are managing tax revenue and spending and the you know, transfer programs along with Congress, you know, all those uh, legislated, uh, legislated programs. So um, now let me turn to Greece and Italy. These are countries, let me turn to Greece in particular. This is a country where um, they were running massive federal budget deficits. Uh, so this is their fiscal side. <laughs> nothing to do with their monetary side because Greece is a part of the Eurozone. So monetary policy in Greece is actually was set in uh, Frankfurt, Germany as part of the Eurozone. Um, Greece got into a problem because their government started running all these uh, budget deficits and, uh, and they paid for those deficits by issuing debt, by issuing you know, their equivalent of treasury bonds. And at some point, um, as long as you think that they're going to be paid back in full, you know, they could borrow at pretty low interest rates. And if you look at the Greece um, interest rates on their government debt, they were fairly low until this uh, Great Recession hit. Then um, people lost faith in the ability of the Greek government to pay back uh, those bonds, and they started demanding an extra 
what we call risk premium for them, and that's why the interest rates in that debt arose to the order of 10 or 20 percent. Um, so that's and but because the interest rates rose, you know, and the government has to pay. Not only do they have to um, borrow to finance the excess of spending over tax revenue, when those interest rates rise, they have to pay that interest as well, and and that caused further problems for the uh, government. So. Um, Again, just talking about the U.S. Treasury, which, again, is completely separate from the Fed. I mean, the U.S. government, the federal government, has been running these budget, large budget deficits. If you look at the sources of them, it's largely because of the Great Recession. The Great Recession, people were unemployed. They weren't earning income. They weren't paying taxes. Uh, and, uh, and that, coupled with uh, unemployment insurance programs, which expanded, again, owing to the recession and more people being unemployed, that's why this uh, budget deficit expanded, and the federal government had to borrow a lot. But um, the difference between us and Greece is, despite the fact that we did borrow a, a lot, uh, uh, you know, investors around the world and within the U.S. still trust uh, the U.S. government to pay back that uh, debt. And that's why interest rates, the 10-year interest rate is 2.5%. I think we all, as savers, we all wish that interest rate was higher um, so we could earn more on it. But it's so, uh, the reason why it's so low is because there is so much faith in the U.S. government that it will pay back uh, its uh, debt. And in fact, uh, if you look at the worst times of the financial crisis, that's when um, the Treasury interest rates actually fell the most because everybody around the world was leaving, you know, whatever debt they were buying elsewhere to buy our debt. So... Um, uh, so I would just say, you don't even have to believe my word. Take uh, the, through the market prices what the markets are telling you, which is that there's still tremendous faith in the uh, U.S. Uh, government uh, treasury debt. So I've kind of strayed a bit from the main topic because, again, this is treasury, the federal fiscal stuff. That's separate from the central bank. But um, anyway. Thank you. You kind of touched on a little bit of my question. <clears throat> Um, it, uh, obviously, if China and the other alternate reserve currencies that they're trying to start establishing come into being and gain um, confidence, that obviously would have impact how that all plays out. But I, just a setup question for clarification, and then my my follow up question because I don't want uh, if the if you pay interest on reserves that's actually, in a way, creating even more money then, right? If, if we get to that point. So it would be essentially creating more money, putting more money out there. Um, so th I guess my question then would be, why not just create a res uh, uh, increase the reserve rate that the banks are required to keep on deposit and just raise that rate instead of paying interest and trying to compete with uh, the interest that'll be out there because it seems like this definitely could stop inflation, but it seems like it would bring about very high interest rates, which would really threaten the federal government um, and risk currency debasement. So why not just set the rate higher that require them to keep those reserves on deposit? So that's a good question. So I'm going to give a partial answer and then I'm going to turn to uh, Dick. So. Your question is, instead of, um, like, say, when the economy is booming and there's a threat of inflation, right now we're going to, um, uh, right now we plan to raise that interest on reserves to uh, ward off uh, inflation by um, de-incentivizing uh, banks from making too many loans. So your uh, question is, why don't uh, the Fed, uh, why doesn't the Fed use this other tool they have, which I actually didn't talk about it at all, which is this... Uh, required reserve ratio. Um, there's, it's a particular number. I think it's uh, roughly 8% uh, right now. So it's 8% uh, of a fraction of the deposits that uh, people have at, at a particular bank. That's what the bank has to hold in reserve at the Fed. Why doesn't the Fed just you know, modulate that uh, required reserve ratio uh, as a way to ward off uh, inflation? So I, I think the main uh, answer to that is um, because we don't know, um, we don't have a good sense of how when we manipulate that required reserve rate, 
how that's going to then affect uh, the amount of loan activity, uh, et cetera. Whereas this interest on reserves, um, there's lots of interest rates out there. And so when we observe the behavior of all the other market interest rates out there, we basically are getting a sense of how much we need to raise that uh, interest on uh, reserves. So a lot of it is simply just tracking other market rates and then maybe adding a little bit extra to it to de-incentivize the banks. So I think that's the reason. But Dick, do you have thoughts on that? Well, I think uh, I'd agree with what you said. I'd, I'd point out a couple of things. First of all, I think uh, you may um, be including in your question the idea that we might not pay any interest on the required reserves, which we could. We have that option of not paying interest on the re on the required reserves, which, you know, from your perspective of saving on expenses, would be uh, the way to go. Um, that, of course, would get you back to the point you raised earlier, Kamu, about the. Um, inefficiency of taxing banks that way. We tend not to think that's an efficient tax. But even if we ignored that, um, then there's the, um, uh, you referred to the 8%. The Federal Reserve Act at this point has a upper limit on how far we can raise that required reserve. And I think even if we put it at the maximum level, currently there would still be a lot of excess reserves. So we'd still, even if we went maxed out on the required reserve under current legislation, we'd still need the IO, the, the interest rate on the excess reserves as a supplemental tool. And finally, I think, I'm guessing it today, I haven't checked this, but at today's situation, even if we raised, went back to the statute and got authority to move it up much higher as a percentage of deposits, there would probably still be excess reserves. So, I mean, I think we're in a position right now where um, you know, the excess reserves are gonna be with us for a while. Um, so I would add that, I think, to your answers. I think, you agree? Yeah, yeah, yeah does that help? <laughs> uh, given the advent of global competition and internet pricing, isn't inflation to a certain extent self-managed given global competition? And then a uh, follow-up question, looking at the blue line, it seems like the money supply, it's really the reserves that are quite excessive, which I interpret that to mean banks are doing fairly well but employment is still at a standstill. So how do you compel the banks to, to get the cash out of the reserves and into small business, which creates all the employment that we need? Thanks uh, for your questions. They're both uh, good ones. Um, in terms of the internet and global competition, uh, that's right. Um, to the extent there's more, I mean, this is, it, it, to some extent, um, the way to think about increased internet and global competition is the way to think about um, uh, just, you know, from Econ 101, more competition is good. It, it drives down prices so that all else equal, that will tend to have uh, inflation be a little bit uh, lower than uh, otherwise. Um, um, however, um, people have actually studied very carefully uh, internet pricing. In fact, uh, President Obama's, one of his uh, top economic advisors, uh, Austin Goolsby, um, studied this. And uh, they actually found that despite the internet, they looked at some particular goods and services, despite the internet. So you would think that with the internet, dispersion in prices would come down because people would just you know, buy from the guy with low prices and not buy from the guy from high, with high prices and the high price guy would go to business and that would be the end of it. But um, there's still a lot of dispersion in prices um, despite uh, the, the uh, internet. In terms of your uh, second question, um, you know, we're in a market economy, so we're trying to influence the prices of the economy but we don't really want to get in the business of telling institutions and entities what to do with their uh, money. I mean, this is what, you know, this is what China does, although China is actually trying to get out of it. China is trying to modernize its central bank and, and become more like the Fed or, or the central banks in Japan or, or Europe. But China recovered very quickly from um, the 2008 uh, recession. I mean, their recession was a case where they went from 8% growth to zero growth. They didn't actually have negative growth, but they recovered very quickly. And the reason is their central bank just um, gave tons of credit to private banks, and they told the banks that they had to make loans with them. They forced them to make loans. So, you know, we're in a market economy. We can't do that. All we can do is try to incentivize them to, as much as we can to, to, um, to do that. And... Uh, um, 
So let me turn your question slightly. In terms of these um, incentives, um, I told you this IOR is now at 0.25%. One thing we could do to try to incentivize banks to make more loans is lower that uh, rate, maybe to, to um, 0.1% or even to zero. I and mean, then by you know, getting less, less at the Fed, uh, the banks would have more uh, incentive to make loans. And um, that's certainly an issue that the FOMC um, talks about. I mean, if you, um, uh, that, that, I mean, that's a potential tool that's, on the, that's on, the, on the table. The only thing is, you know, even if you drove it to zero, I mean, it's, it's only, at the end of the day, it's only a quarter percentage point. So it's, you know, it could help, but it's unclear quantitatively how much uh, it would help. There was a, was there? Hi, uh, I drove by a gas station day in Burnsville that was selling gas for two ninety eight a gallon, and I think that's great for the economy because consumers' paychecks are stretching further than they otherwise would. If inflation is good for the economy, can you explain how cheaper gasoline is bad for the economy? I mean, the Fed uh, the Fed doesn't like uh, a lot of inflation. I mean, the Fed only wants two percent uh, inflation. Now, keep in mind. When we say 2% inflation, we mean an average across a whole basket of goods. I mean, what we care about is, you know, this average across the, the whole basket of goods that people uh, buy. Um, uh, you know, we're not really interested in the prices of individual goods, um, you know, because at any moment in time, some good prices are going up and some are going down. Um, you know, we just care about the, the average. Um, so, so let me ask your question slightly differently. Why is it that the Fed defines price stability as 2% inflation as opposed to zero uh, inflation? And uh, there are a few reasons given for this, um, but one of them is um, it kind of, it, it's, it's almost a behavioral psychological uh, reason, but uh, the basic idea is that uh, let's say you're in a company and uh, you have to give out wage uh, increases uh, every year and uh, if the inflation rate is two percent that means you can set you know you can have your wage pool be two percent and um, you know in every company there are you know the workers who did better during the year and then the workers who didn't do as well during the year and it's a lot easier if you have two percent inflation and a two percent wage pool um, to give say some guys three percent raises and other people one percent raises then in a world where you have zero inflation and a zero wage pool to give somebody a 1% increase and somebody else a negative 1% change. Now, if, you're, if we're all rational agents, those two scenarios should be exactly the same because what really matters is the real purchasing power of our wages. But uh, in these experiments that um, psychologists and economists have done, people always p prefer to be in that world of uh, 2% uh, wage increases where some people get three and the others get one than in this world where they actually get wage decreases. So that's uh, one reason. Um, there's another reason which is uh, tied to the fact that for some reason all loans are denominated in terms of nominal interest rates. I mean, let's go back to the Great Depression, the grapes of wrath, and you know that whole image of uh, farmers um, being uh, foreclosed on by the, by the banks and uh, then being forced to drive off. And, uh, um, you know, the reason why the farmers uh, couldn't pay back the loans is because we ha you had deflation. They, maybe they took out a loan at 5% interest. But then if the prices of the crops and everything else fell by 50%, then there's no way they can pay back uh, that uh, loan. So, um, by, you know, the, so you always want to have a little bit of inflation to kind of prevent this uh, situation wh um, where, um, due to deflation, you get all these people going uh, bankrupt. So if we, we had a zero inflation target, you're just going to make a deflation outcome a little bit more likely, which uh, makes these situations where um, defaults, um, uh, makes defaults uh, uh, a little bit more likely uh, as well. I think there were a couple questions over here. So. Hi. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Fed for putting on this uh, presentation. It's been it's very, very good, and I would encourage you to get it out into the, the high schools and colleges and take it on the road. 
if you haven't already done so. My question relates to the, the, the new tool. And um, you need another tool because the existing tool isn't as effective as it once was. And you've indicated some of the challenges of the tool. And so I'd like to, my question is, what is your confidence level of when you start to use the tool that you don't over or under compensate? In other words, you don't raise the rate too high too fast and have a negative effect. What is your confidence level? Because we haven't used the tool yet. So how do we know how well it's going to work, how effective it's going to be, and how you can calibrate it? So that's a very good question. I would, you know, we can't have confidence based on experience because we haven't used that tool before. But we can have some confidence based on the fact that these challenges that we face about raising it too fast and cutting off the uh, recovery or not raising it fast enough and causing excess inflation, those are challenges that the Fed faces all the time in, in boom and recession cycles and that they use the federal funds rate tool um, to try to address. Now, going forward with this interest on reserves, um, it, it turns out the way, the way the interest on reserves and the federal funds rate work, um, because they both will involve, because banks will be involved in both of them, those two rates are going to move pretty closely to each other. So it's not like, um, so in other words, the kind of thinking that we had about whether to raise the federal funds rate uh, at a really rapid pace or a moderately rapid pace, that type of thinking will um, also apply to this uh, interest on reserves as well. So that's a, a sense in which uh, I think we are fairly confident, which is not to say that we were perfect in the past, but just that the level of success we had in the past, I think, is likely to be uh, replicated uh, going forward once the U.S. economy starts getting into this faster recovery mode that I um, talked about earlier, which we're not really in uh, right now. Um, I jump in on that, Kamu. Yeah. A couple of things. First of all, Kamu mentioned earlier that um, while I, I agree that we have confidence, one reason we have confidence in addition is that tools like this have been used to some extent in other countries before, not maybe with quite as large a balance sheet as we have now, but there is experience internationally with using interest on reserves. So we have some idea from that. Uh, in addition to having confidence, though, we're not, we're not putting all the eggs in this basket. We do have confidence in it. I'm pretty sure it will work, but we have the belt and spenders approach, he, he did mention some other tools we have. We have ways of, of um, uh, bidding with banks to have them tie up reserves through other mechanisms too if necessary. And, and, and as he mentioned, we also have the option if, ne if need be just to reduce our balance sheet too. So it's not the only option, even though we have, uh, based on logic and inter international experience, we do have high confidence. This, this question goes to the, your balance sheet. And you pointed out that uh, the chart shows that how rapidly it has been expanding. And you mentioned that there is a significant difference now as compared to something Rob. in the past where, uh, where interest, uh, where you now have a lot of long-term assets in, on the balance sheet. And there was something in the press just recently where somebody was questioning what happens if we should have a spike in interest rates, and the, the value of the Fed's long-term assets would decline materially. What does that do to your balance sheet? So that's a good question. Um, so let me give a two-part answer to that. So um, by law or the Fed, in the Fed statute, we do not do um, what is known as mark-to-market accounting. So when, if interest rates uh, spike, um, while the market value of those assets, uh, the assets that we hold uh, will fall, for example, the mortgage-backed securities, while the market value of them will fall, um, because we did not do mark-to-market accounting, that's not going to really affect us in any material way. So that's part one. Part two is um, if interest rates spike, and because we pay interest on reserves, chances are the interest on reserves will also tend to uh, increase, and, um, and that's a cost uh, to the Fed. Um, one thing I didn't mention is we have this balance sheet. Um, all those assets, we're earning interest on those assets. And in, in the olden days, um, the old days, 
where um, we didn't have that many assets um, and they were tended to be short-term securities where the interest rates are a little bit lower, you know, um, the interest earnings that, that we earned on those assets after you subtracted off uh, Dick and, and my uh, salaries, um, that we would send to the Treasury Department, it was roughly uh, 20 billion a year. So that's, you know, we'd send about 20 billion a year to Treasury. Because we have this expanded balance sheet, we have a lot more assets. We've actually been sending Treasury uh, a lot more in recent years. It's been more like 90 billion a year. But um, again, we've benefited um, because we bought these assets, you know, at interest rates of four or five uh, percent. Um, but then we're only paying this quarter percentage point interest on reserves, and so we're getting all this big spread, and again, we're turning over this to the Treasury. But suppose your scenario plays out and interest rates spike and it forces us to pay higher interest rates, higher interest on reserves, that's going to cut the amount that we, like our profit, the amount that we give to Treasury. Um, and there are scenarios, and we have some public uh, working papers uh, on this that the Federal Reserve Board has issued. There are scenarios of interest rate spikes where the amount that we turn over to Treasury will go to zero, actually, and potentially could even go negative. And uh, that in and of itself is, is, is not gonna, shouldn't affect us in the sense that our goal is not to maximize profits to Treasury. Our goal is to, you know, create maximum employment and have stable uh, inflation. But there are people who are worried that if we're not turning money over to Treasury, and especially in a world where Medicare and other expenses and federal budget deficits, which have been declining lately, but are expected to go back up again in the future, um, you know, people are worried. I mean, Congress sets our mandate. People are concerned that uh, maybe Congress will change our mandate and, and, and not give us. One of the things that Congress has done, in addition to giving us the ma it's our mandate, they've essentially left us alone. I mean, we're a fairly apolitical institution. And, um, and, and overall, we think that's good because uh, in general, I think Congress uh, would want us to have looser monetary policy than otherwise, and uh, that would generate more inflation than otherwise. So it's good that we have some independence. But if we get into a world where interest rates spike and we, the amount of remittances, the, the amount of funds that we turn over to Treasury drops a lot or even potentially goes to zero, there's a concern that uh, Congress may get mad at us and uh, may take away uh, some of our independence and might have more oversight over us. So that's a potential uh, uh, concern out there. One thing I might just add, Kimo, I think in, in the scenarios you were discussing where a remittances could go negative, it's, it's only rather temporarily that they do it, like you know, for two or three years. It's not a permanent thing. Right. Right. It's just during a transition period where they temporarily go negative. We go back to, in all these scenarios I'm aware of, before long we go back to earning the right. 20 million a year or 20 billion a year or whatever pretty soon. <clears throat> what of the... Oh, Thank you for the excellent presentation. Also, thank God for the Fed with the rest of the government uh, intransigent. Uh, one of the things that uh, the chairman elect Yellen mentioned was focusing more on uh, unemployment. And you referenced that earlier in the presentation that uh, unemployment is probably not stated uh, accurately or understated. And some of my very conservative friends point out the failures of the administration and Congress uh, by using uh, different measures of unemployment ranging up to 16 to 20%, including discouraged workers. Could you comment on the choice of the target measure and, and what the Fed might do, if anything, to reduce unemployment? Yeah, so I talked earlier about um, the unemployment rate, how it's come down very slowly, and how even this uh, existing, the, the decline that we see, it may understate uh, the extent of improvement in labor markets uh, because a lot of the decline in unemployment is just because workers have gotten so discouraged uh, they've stopped looking for work and when that happens they're no longer counted as unemployed. So the Bureau of Labor Statistics which puts out all these numbers um, has other measures of unemployment as you mentioned and some of them when they include uh, discouraged uh, workers or they can even include uh, part-time workers who really want to be working full-time then you can get numbers you know like 16 or 20 percent the only thing is the pattern in those other pictures is actually very similar um, to, to the pattern here. A steep rise and then a decline 
you know, a slow decline, but you know, clear, a, a clear decline uh, over the last few years. So um, they're not really telling that different a story you know, than the main measure that, uh, that uh, we uh, look at. Um, what's the kind of the target that we're headed to? Um, there's no, um, unlike with the inflation rate, because you know, we feel confident that we can hit this 2% inflation, that's why we've put that number out there. Unemployment, because as you said, there's lots of factors that affect employment and unemployment, um, tax policy, just the fact that our workforce is aging, um, that's going to affect it. These are things the Fed doesn't control at all, so that's why we don't have a particular numerical target. But if you look, uh, there's this quarterly survey of the, all the Federal um, Reserve presidents and governors, and they kind of give what they think the unemployment rate will reach eventually in the long run. That range is roughly between 5.2 and 6 percent. So if you, you can take that range as a rough sense of where the um, Fed thinks uh, the unemployment rate can get to um, and where the economy can then be considered at full employment. And you'll notice this range of 5.2 to 6 is, is higher than where we were before the recession started. And that partly reflects the fact that uh, people think in some sense there was some permanent damage done by this uh, recession. Um, uh, that, um, uh, so for example, the, there was this big boom in the construction industry uh, before the recession in the housing industry. There's a view that you know, it's never gonna go back to where it was before, so that the housing industry, and, and uh, because of that, there are all these workers in the construction industry that are gonna have to find different uh, jobs, and uh, you can't overnight become a, go from a construction worker to a nurse or, a, um, or a, uh, an MBA or a lawyer or whatever, so um, maybe eventually, but um, uh, it will take a lot of time for that to happen. So to the extent the economy needs to reorient itself in a significant way, um, then you can see that um, the unemployment rate can be higher than, even at, at uh, when we fully recovered, the unemployment rate can be higher than where we were before the recession started. We have time for one last question. Um, just to follow up on the Fed balance sheet, um, since before 2009, the Fed wasn't really doing very much with purchasing agency debt and mortgage-backed securities. And just because we know that so much of the problem was caused by banks holding on to uh, debt in this realm that was not good, um, can you comment on the selection process that the Fed has to purchase these and what the, what the risk features are um, of that piece of it. I mean, obviously with two trillion in treasuries, there's a lot of safe assets, but I'm, I'm curious about the risk of the agency, the trillion that you're holding now, an agency that um, suddenly appeared after 2009. Yeah, these are um, essentially as uh, riskless as the treasuries because all these mortgage-backed securities are government-backed uh, mortgage-backed securities. I mean, Fannie and Freddie, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were these quasi-government institutions prior to the um, uh, recession, but then in late 2008, uh, the government essentially took them over. So Fannie and Freddie are essentially government uh, institutions now. So these are securities that Fannie and Freddie have issued. So um, they're essentially you know, very close to being uh, treasury securities. So in terms of uh, what I'll call credit risk, um, there's very little risk there. The main risk is um, interest rate risk that uh, one of the earlier questioners talked about, that we could just have a spike in uh, interest rates. Um, that's that's the, uh, the risk, not um, credit or default uh, risk. Well, why don't we thank Kay Moo and Dick for the presentation tonight. Uh, thanks a lot.